Good evening. My name is Craig Floss, and I'm the Chief Executive Officer for the Iowa Corn Growers Association and the Iowa Corn Promotion Board. And I would like to thank you and welcome you for coming to the Food Dialogues Iowa event here at Ames. Uh, to those here at Iowa State and to those who are listening online, uh, on behalf of Iowa Corn, uh, we really want to say thank you for coming to participate in this discussion. We very much also appreciate the U.S. Farm and Ranch Alliance and their support of this event and these important dialogues. Tonight we're going to talk about one of the most important topics that I can think of, where our food comes from and how it is produced. All of us are responsible for learning the facts and deciding for ourselves and our families for what we stand on with these important issues. We're bringing together experts from all over the food production spectrum, asking smart questions, and carefully listening to each other. I'd like to thank our moderator and panelists for giving up their time, their valuable time to be with us tonight. And now I'd like to introduce our esteemed moderator who will kick us off with some introductions and some guidelines for tonight's event. On behalf of all of us at Iowa Corn and the U.S. Farm and Ranch Alliance, thanks again for being here and we look forward to continuing this discussion and hearing your feedback. John Bachman is an enduring figure in TV news in central Iowa. He recently retired from a long and distinguished career as anchor of WHO-TV news team and the host of The Insiders, a show which discusses, discusses current issues here in Iowa. John has not stopped working yet and has graciously agreed to help moderate our discussion this evening. Please help me in welcoming John Bachman. Thank you, Craig. Thank you, one and all, for being here tonight. Um, after spending a quarter of a century covering the news in Des Moines, I think it's fair to say that I realize that for Iowans, food production is one of the most important topics indeed. Uh, food plant and food scientists and farmers have, have labored over the years to try to increase the supply of food and its availability to a growing world population. It's an important subject with a lot of ramifications and uh, divergent opinions, and we're going to share those tonight. Consumers are an important part of it, and uh, they're represented here in the audience and at home online, and we're going to hear from you as well. The Food Dialogues Iowa event is sponsored by U.S. Farmers and Ranchers Alliance, and they have partnered with the Iowa Corn Growers Association and the Iowa Corn Production Board to put on this event. The idea behind the Food Dialogues is to give experts and average citizens the opportunity to learn more about each other's positions on these very important issues. Tonight's discussion is going to be a respectful one. Uh, Craig mentioned the insiders. And I would compare it to that. At least that's our goal. Our goal with the insiders was to present a platform where we could share ideas, divergent ideas, but learn from each other and have a forum for that. Uh, it was kind of built in contrast to, I guess you'd say, mostly cable TV news shows where you have angry, shouting, what we call talking heads, virtually shouting past each other, not necessarily providing much information, and often entertaining, not very enlightening. I've had the opportunity to have supper with our panelists, and I'm pleased to say that they are enlightened and can be entertaining. So I think we're going to have a treat tonight. Um, it's one of those things Iowans are used to, because we know through the caucus process how important it is to really do our job and study to get all the information we can and then make our own decision. And that's what we hope is going to happen tonight. Uh, a few uh, housekeeping items before we get started. This event is webcast live at www.iowacorn.org. You can also follow the proceedings on Twitter using hashtag FoodD at Iowa underscore corn or at USFRA. Now, even though your phones are going to be on and uh, tweeting during the event, we ask that you please 
silence all ringtones and alarms on your phones so we can have a disruption-free discussion. The dialogue will be an open discussion. If you have a question, feel free to ask it at one of the microphones. We're going to do that about halfway into the program and open it up. You can also, if you don't want to go to the microphone, uh, write out a question and hand the card to one of our hosts. And then we'll also be taking questions from Twitter. We want to thank everybody for being here. And I'm going to introduce now, in alphabetical order, our esteemed panel. Larry Cleverly, and I'll ask you to stand up as I give the background and bio, is an organic farmer, supplier, and farmer's market vendor from Mingo, Iowa. Larry is a fixture at the fabulous downtown Des Moines Farmer's Market and supplies much of the seasonal produce at some of the most beloved metro restaurants. Every spring, Larry and his wife Beth swing open the gates of their farm to host Garlic Palooza, and they give tours to all who are interested in learning about their farm. Wayne Humphreys raises corn and soybeans and operates a custom hog feeding operation near Columbus Junction in Loiza County. He has been a farmer for nearly 40 years and is a member of the Iowa Corn Growers Association and a member of the Iowa Farm Bureau Association. Dave Murphy is a native Iowan from Clear Lake and the founder and executive director of Food Democracy Now! a grassroots movement of more than 650,000 American farmers and citizens dedicated to reforming policies relating to food, agriculture, and the environment. Dave served as the co-chair of Prop 37 in California. He helped pass GMO labeling bills this year in Connecticut and Maine and videotaped Barack Obama promising to label GMOs in 2007 during the Iowa caucuses. Katie Althoff is a turkey farmer who lives in Stanhope, Iowa, She's a graduate of Iowa State University, and her farm raises three flocks of turkeys at a time, each consisting of 20,000 birds. Katie is a member of Common Ground, an organization with the goal of helping consumers understand that their tool, that their food, is not grown by a factory. It is grown by people. Dr. Wayne Parrott is a professor in the Department of Crop and Soil Sciences at the College of Agriculture and Environmental Sciences at the University of Georgia. He is actively engaged in training graduate students and postdoctoral fellows, teaches courses in genetics, agroecology, and sustainable agriculture. He has advised legislators and regulators in several countries on creating a functional regulatory system that ensures the safety of GMO products. And Dr. John Schellinger is a group crop uh, researcher who started his career in academia at Michigan State, where he began his research on soybeans. In 1973, John was hired by ASGRO and helped develop a new soybean variety that was named Product of the Decade by U.S. Agri-Marketing. Since 2003, he started his own company, which focuses on providing high-yield, high-nutrition, non-GMO seed varieties. I think we should applaud all of them for being with us tonight. I'd like to begin with what I think is, uh, it's a simple but uh, probably complex ramifications, but I think it's a fundamental question and I want to start, I'll ask uh, Wayne, what do we really know from scientific research about the safety of GMO seeds and crops? Well, good evening, you all, and uh, thanks for the invitation uh, to be here, even if you forgot to turn the thermostat up outside for me. <laughs> Uh, that's probably the, the fundamental question. It turns out that uh, these are really the most uh, studied foods in the history of mankind. Uh, we, at last count, we had over uh, 600 refereed uh, publications on the topic. And on top of that, uh, because of our global market, they have been reviewed by the FDA in the US, the, in the US, but also by the FDA equivalents in all major export markets. And uh, furthermore, uh, we've been planting them since 1994. Um, we have statistics since 1996. And uh, by last year alone, they were planted on about uh, 350 million acres around the world by over 17 million farmers. So at this point, we have information from some 30 countries, from some uh, 17 years, from some uh, 17 million farmers. And uh, 
with that wealth of data, we can answer just about uh, any question that people might have. All right. Um, let me ask Dave Murphy the same question. Well, thank you, John. Uh, again, I want to thank the Iowa, Farmer, Iowa Corn Growers and the U.S. Farmers and Ranchers Alliance for inviting me here. Uh, it's not often that I get a chance to share the stage with uh, Farmers and Ranchers and I Alliance, and I appreciate this opportunity to have a civil dialogue. But let's be serious. It's not factually accurate to say the GMOs are the most te tested crop or technology and human invention. It's not even factually accurate. The real truth is, this is a technology that is unraveling in farmers' fields as we speak. Uh, the, right now, there's uh, over 230 scientists that are just signing a letter, getting started, to talk about that the fact there is no real consensus on the science behind genetically engineered food on whether it's safe. The truth is, what happened in the 1990s during the regulatory process when they were trying to come up with the original standards to determine safety and risk for genetic engineering a political decision by political appointees in the first Bush administration overrode Food and Drug Administration's own scientists, their own scientists, that said that genetic engineering is, increases risk for known toxicants and allergic responses. Right now, in the past three years, major studies are coming out month after month that show real potential and significant risk from this technology. And it's not just the fact that artificial genes are inserted from bacteria and viruses, from other viruses and bacteria into crops and animals. It's the fact that most genetically engineered crops come along with herbicides or pesticides like Roundup or atrazine. And these chemicals are known to be toxic and cause cancer and cause real health problems for humans and the environment. I want to talk about one study real quickly that came out last year. A French professor, Cialini, came out with a study that showed that it was a two-year feeding study that showed that Roundup and the GMO corn from Monsanto caused an increased risk of tumors starting at the fourth to seventh month. Monsanto's own toxicological studies that they submit to the Food and Drug Administration end at 90 days. So you're always going to find safety if you, if you submit a test for a regulatory agency if the test ends at 90 days, when the real harm does not show up to the fourth or seventh month. The other factor is the, the Food and Drug Administration, the regulatory agencies here in the US, they do not conduct their own independent science. What they do is they take corporate science submitted to them, and then they approve it. That is how the regulatory process has been done here in the United States for 20 years, and it has not protected America's farmers or consumers. I want to stay on this topic because it is so important and so fundamental. And I'll give, Wayne, I'll give you a chance to respond to his points, if we could. Uh, yes, uh, thank you so much. The, you know, there's always uh, as, uh, more to the story uh, than uh, one can imagine. For example, there's an, you said that there was an increased uh, risk of toxicants, but it's always compared to what? And we compare it to what the type of changes that we as plant breeders have been doing for the past uh, 100 years. And uh, because we're in the era of the human genome, the human genome tools, when we use those to analyze plants, we really cannot find any of the biochemistry or the mechanisms necessary there to increase uh, toxicants. Uh, to say that uh, GM is associated with pesticide use, that's quite true, but agriculture since World War II has been associated with uh, pesticide use. So it is, you know, uh, we, what hopefully we've done in many cases is traded the old chemistry for new chemistry, and in other cases, uh, we've actually been able to, uh, particularly with insecticides, really uh, reduce their use quite a lot. Uh, you brought up the French study with Seralini. Uh, the missing detail there is that he used a strain of rat that normally gets uh, tumors anyway. Uh, the natural tumor rate is 18 is 80 uh, percent, you know, before they're uh, two years old. So every single, uh, you know, the French uh, and the European uh, uh, food regulators and uh, everybody else has really chastised that study as being incredibly um, in inadequate in many different ways. In fact, uh, uh, the, both the Health Canada and the Food 
and uh, the Food Safety Authority from Australia have uh, dissected it out and found over 30 major flaws, and it's posted on uh, those government websites that shows why uh, it is really not something that we want to take seriously. I, I want to ask John Schillinger, because you've worked with GMOs and non-GMOs, and I'd like to know your opinion on this very important topic. Well, <clears throat> I think it's, uh, the, the issue is, is divided, no, no doubt about it. Um, and there's proponents of, uh, of research that prove one thing and other prove another. I, I, uh, I think the the basic premise of uh, GM is 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 good, but there is like anything else in in science, and, and it can be overdone and it can be unchecked at times. And that that's the threat that I see is that to introduce keep introducing new GMOs is is probably not in the best interest of food and food uh, uh, and, and nutrition. Uh, I, th I think I take a, a, a different course in that I believe within the natural uh, genomes of soybeans and corn, there is a, a marvelous amount of genetic variation uh, and diversity that can be applied to very useful uh, concepts in food production. And I cho choose to go that way because I think in the crop that I'm working mostly with is, is soybeans. And it's amazing amount the, that we can do to improve protein, protein quality, protein quantity, to remove some of the anti-nutritionals in soy and take full advantage of all the potential that's there in the way of really wholesome and well-balanced protein and removing some of the hindrances to digestibility in animals and humans. So I, I I think if you're looking at the world uh, situation and feeding uh, the people in, in 2050 that's going to be on the earth, I, I think there's a lot of work that can be done in a, in a non-GMO without the G I do not believe the GMO, GMs are the answer to the world hunger crisis that's coming. I think it's good science can be practiced within the non-GMO realm of, of research that can be very, very useful in, uh, in feeding the world. And it's it, translates down to local farmers in some of these countries that I'm working in, in Krakistan and parts of China and Africa. It, it is a marvelous way to take natural genetic variation and translate it down so the local farmers can grow it, process it without having to heat it or treat it with chemicals, and feed it to their fish or their chickens or their cattle. Wayne, let me ask you as a farmer, um, John just raised the point of there being projected by 2059 billion people in the world, uh, will we be able to feed those people without GMOs, without expanded use of GMOs? Thanks, John. Um, I am a uh, probably the most typical farmer in Iowa. We raise corn and soybeans. And I, I read like everyone else that's with us tonight. Uh, and I'm, I'm taken by the uh, statement by an analyst uh, that said, all statistics are wrong, uh, some are useful. <laughs> um, and I, I, I worry about uh, new technology, but at the same time, I embrace it. Uh, I feel good about the triple stacked corn that we plant because it definitely reduces the number of insecticide applications that we make. My sense is that insecticide applications are more dangerous than herbicide applications are for the environment. Uh, nine billion people by the, the year 2050 uh, definitely means there will be uh, hungry people, definitely means there will be a need, may not meet the definition of increased demand for Iowa corn and Iowa soybeans. Uh, as the world expands population, we need to also be concerned about expanding education, about moving more people into the middle class. As they move to the middle class, as their educations improve, birth rates go down. Uh, it's a very complex uh, situation that we face in merely producing more foods with or without, whether they be or not be GMOs, uh, is, is too complex to answer with just one facet. Uh, being increased, John. Let me ask you uh, about labeling uh, GMO ingredients. Um, and Katie, let me ask you, uh, mm -hmm. w where do you come on 
which side of the issue do you fall on that? This is a tough question. Um, gosh, there's a lot of things that go into the labeling of GMO ingredients. And as a mom, I have two little boys. They're two and a half and five. And I always want to make sure that the food that we have is safe. But there are so many times that labels can be very confusing, especially to someone who's not involved in agriculture. We, on our farm, we raise turkeys. We do not grow corn and soybeans. And so honestly, um, I turn to professionals and scientists for the answers about whether GMOs are safe. Uh, will a label tell me whether or not GMOs are safe? I don't think so, but they will probably give the impression that GMOs are dangerous. And one of the things that we see in the turkey industry, especially this time of year, is you'll see labels that say hormone-free turkey. That makes you think that turkeys with hormones must be worse, right? Because people are paying more for hormone-free turkey. In reality, no turkeys in the United States are, are raised with any hormones. So that label really doesn't give the consumer any beneficial information. And I'm not sure that a label for GMOs would give a consumer any beneficial information either. Larry, let me ask you about labeling. Well, I think strictly from a common sense standpoint, that a consumer is entitled to know what's in the food that they're buying. And whether it be a GMO or whether it be xanthan gum or no matter what the ingredient is, you know, I, I can't see why anyone wouldn't want to know what is in their food. But for some reason, Monsanto has spent well over $100 million so far to defeat GMO labeling legislation in the U.S. and Canada. $100 million plus. That tells me, number one, that they're very afraid that if a label has GMO on it, that people will get the sense that that is a bad thing. I don't necessarily think they're right. If GMOs are not a bad thing, then what is there to be afraid of? So, you know, I come down fully and, and, uh, and soundly on the side of labeling. I just think that people are entitled to know. It's, it's simple. Dave, you've been involved in campaigns. Uh, mm -hmm. Now, there was a defeat just recently in Washington, is that correct? on a labeling law. That's correct. We, we just had a vote on November 5th, and the, um, the no side Originally, won. the poll said that you would win. They did. What happened? Well, it's pretty easy. I think it, what, what we're finding here in, in America is that democracy is for sale. The la in California last year, the biotech industry and the junk food, big food companies spent $46 million to defeat California's right to know. Monsanto spent $8.1 million. Just in the last month, in Washington State in the last week and a half, we lost a ballot initiative by f basically 51 to 49 percent. The ballots are still being counted. The opposition spent $22 million to defeat Washington State citizens' right to know what's in their food. I think Monsanto put in $5.4 million. The, the Grocery Manufacturers Association put in $11 million. This is a consortium of all the big food companies that everyone likes to eat here in America, Coke, Pepsi, Nestle, Kraft, Kellogg's, and General Mills. The fact is, in my estimation, I'm a citizen of the United States. I have a basic right to know what's in my food, and corporations do not have the right to hide that information. In a democracy, openness and transparency should prevail. In a capitalist society, you need basic information to make informed decisions, to be a participant in the capitalist structure. I want to go back to something that Wayne said about, about the Sierra Leone study, about the rats. Yes, they use the Sprague Dolly rats. That is the same rat that Monsanto used in its safety assessment, its 90s day safety assessment. It's the same rat that is commonly used in toxicological studies. The fact here is that you can, you can talk about GMOs being perfectly safe. You can talk to them being the most tested product on the market. The truth is the American people are never going to trust them unless the biotech industry and food companies put a label on it. And we are here to fight for mandatory labeling. So thank you. Sorry. Go ahead. Um, Katie, go. From a mom perspective and a farmer perspective, 
I did not grow up on a farm. When we started raising turkeys about five years ago, this was all very brand new to me. Um, and I agree that people have a right to know what is in their food and a right to know what is happening on farms. Um, at, but I don't necessarily agree that labeling is the best way to do that. I think what we're doing here tonight, talking with farmers and presenting this information and being transparent and sharing what we do on our farms with consumers, I think that educating them about these issues is a key part of letting them know what's in their food. It's not just slapping a label on something. We have to have that education component with it. And um, you know that's why. Or, organizations like Common Ground really try to reach out and share with consumers what is really happening on farms, how we make the decisions that we do on farms, whether it's related to GMOs or animal welfare or antibiotic use or whatever it is, we want to share that information. Labeling is not the be all and end all to information sharing. Is labeling sharing. more expensive though? That's what I've heard. So if I, I, I could just... Nothing to do with it. If I could just uh, chime in here a second. Um, I'm going to actually begin by agreeing with uh, Larry and Dave. I like to know what's in my food. And in f the, the issue is that GMOs, it's not an ingredient. It's a process. And sometimes this process changes to food. And actually, current FDA regulations are that you do have to label. Uh, high Lake soybean would be a perfect example of that. Golden rice would be another example of that. But for the rest of the time, it's either going to have be non-detectable in food or be at the same level as other traces that are not labeled. So why are we picking that one thing out of many? Quite frankly, I'm much more concerned with the carbon uh, footprint of my food uh, as part of the process, and that's not on the label either. And I'm sure every, each one of you would have your own thing that you'd want to see on the label. So as far as cost goes, in the United States, the regulations are that uh, labels have to be useful, truthful, and non-misleading. So yes, you do have to prove, uh, you have to be able to, you know, to analyze and show that what's on the label is real. So yes, there is cost of monitoring and validating what the labels claim. And at the end, the way the Washington State uh, labeling proposition was, you had to put the label on the front of the package prominently. The, uh, it just kind of reminds me of the cigarette warning labels. And uh, the, so it was implying lack of safety, and a lot of the ads kind of like to show the biohazard signs, skull and crossbones, sort of associating GMOs with lack of safety. But a current, I think what the FDA wants to be the one that uh, trusted scientists uh, to determine uh, safety, and quite frankly, I know it, a lot of them, and they're top caliber scientists, and they didn't quite happen the way you mentioned it. But at the end, you know, it, they are the ones that, are, that decide if it's safety. It, we don't have elections of popular opinion to determine if something is safe or not. Wayne, you wanted to add something. I wanted to yeah. ask uh, Larry and Dave, uh, as a consumer, uh, my understanding is that the Grocers Association one of their biggest problems is the logistics of various labels for various states in the distribution network. Uh, it, what if we had a national labeling system rather than an individual state proposition uh, hodgepodge of labeling? Would, would that solve some problems? Some. Well, first of all, this isn't my area of expertise. Uh, but. <laughs> I've made a fool of myself in public before, and this probably won't be the last time. We should start a club. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I, I think a, you know a, a national law that was equal for all 50 states would obviously be simpler than 50 individual laws. Um, I, you know, I don't think the cost of labeling is is a problem. Um, but the logistics but, but, are, are... Yeah, the, the, the logistics of 50 different laws would be hmm. a nightmare for a manufacturing company. Be that as it may, you know, there, there are some different requirements for some different things now, and, and the, they all seem to be able to do that just fine. But, and correct me if I'm wrong here, again, not my area of expertise, but my understanding is there have been no long-term human studies as to the as to the effects of GMO on human health none 
not a single long-term study. So if I choose as a consumer not to ingest GMOs beyond my knowledge, then I think I should be entitled to be able to do that. I do my best to do that now, but I eat a lot of food off my own farm, and I eat a lot of food from farmers that I know. I'm much more fortunate than your average consumer, but the fact that there have been no long-term studies on human health effects of GMOs makes me think that a consumer is entitled not to eat those GMOs if that's what they choose to do. If they want to eat GMOs, great. I, I'm, it's, you know, I'm not here to tell anyone how to eat. I'm not here to tell anyone how to farm. I'm here to tell people why I eat what I do and why I farm the way I do. But labeling to me just seems like such a no-brainer. But it obviously has turned out to be far more complicated than that. Yes, Dave. Yeah, just real quickly. For those of us that are working on legislative efforts to win labeling the genetically engineered foods in the United States, we, we fundamentally believe that all 50 states should have labeling. But the problem here is the political process is stuck in Washington, D.C. for the past 20 years. The lobbying efforts have been able to keep labeling off the public bill. The fact is we're using the citizen-led ballot initiative process to have a conversation on this technology and our basic rights as they pertain to food and the food that we eat as consumers. And I think it's really important that we understand that the rules and regulations in this country are written in a very specific way because some of the most powerful companies on the planet not only have spent millions of dollars to defeat our right to know in these ballot initiatives, but they spent millions of dollars every year for lobbying, for lobbying efforts. And my, in the 1990s, the very interesting thing is, today we're having a conversation on labeling of genetically engineered foods. That has been denied Americans for 20 years. And the interesting, the really interesting historical perspective here is that the man that helped write the rules at the Food and Drug Administration, a former Monsanto attorney named Michael Taylor, is now back at the Food and Drug Administration, second in command, Deputy Commissioner of Food. And he could, right now, issue a draft guidance that said that genetically engineered foods should be labeled. Interesting, he, we have a president, President of the United States, Barack Obama, during the Iowa caucus. He was here in Iowa, and he promised in front of an audience of 400 Iowa farmers and rural residents, Iowa Farmers Union event, November 10th, 2007, that if he was elected, he would do two things immediately. He would support country of origin labeling, because he thought Americans should know where their food comes from. And he thought that he would support labeling of genetically modified foods, because Americans should know what they're buying. Now, I fundamentally believe those are things that need to happen. But the truth is, what we have today is a regulatory farce at the Food and Drug Administration that was written by a biotech lobbyist that were actually political appointees in the 1990s. They overrode the own Food and Drug Administration's own scientists' concerns. I have to say, as not only someone that cares a lot about technology, but also democracy, that frightens me. It frightens me that we allow lobbyists in this country to write rules and regulations that harm America's family farmers, that cause people to mistrust the products of farmers, and that also that consumers are denied their basic rights in the marketplace. And I think that, you know, if, if we are going to have a strong labeling uh, bill in, in Washington, D.C., it's about time they get on it, and it's all in their power. Thank so you, if I could just follow up on the human safety studies. We want to move on here in, shortly, so mm -hmm. go ahead. Yeah, the uh, uh, references have been made to the 90-day uh, uh, food studies as if it was one study. It's actually a whole battery of studies. But um, the reason there are no uh, human studies is probably the first one is we just don't have any good laboratory strains of humans. If you want to volunteer for a diet of GM corn for the next 20 years inside a confined room, I'm sure there's people that would like to talk to you. But the safety assessment is not based on 90-day studies. It's a very simple premise. We have two things that are absolutely identical. It's impossible to say that this one's harmful and this one is not because they're identical. But now that this one has water in it, or whatever else I had put in it, and I say this one is no longer safe, the safety has to come from what was added to it. So the premise of the safety assessment is to look for 
everything that is present in the GMO that is not present in the non-GMO version and do the safety testing on those. But other than intended changes, all the analytical labs of the world haven't been able to find anything new that is in a GMO that is not in the, um, in the regular version. So there is no new anything in there that could come back and haunt you uh, in the uh, long term. And really, you can't even say that the you know, FDA uh, regulatory system is deficient in the US or corrupt in the US without, unless uh, big companies have managed to buy every single sister agency to the FDA in countries in every country around the world. Uh, Monsanto stock, they tell me, is doing real well, but I don't think it's doing that well. Uh, and thus far, you know, all the major FDA sister agencies around the world find the <clears throat> lack of any novelty things in there that could come back and haunt us. John, real quick. L let me, Can no, I answer we, that? We really have to move on. Um, I'd like to be able to respond, though, because I think that his demonstration uh, needs to be answered. I have some proof here that can show the difference. You know, I brought with 30 seconds. 30 seconds. So he just showed cups in the air, held them up in the air, and right, and that was a very clever trick. What I have here, these are documents in this paper from the Food and Drug Administration in the 1990s. And what they talk about is how their own scientists found that genetic engineering induced new potential risks just by the fact of genetic engineering, increased new risks of toxicants and possible allergic responses. I'm not showing a cup in the air. I'm showing the FDA, the Food and Drug Administration's own scientist document that talked about how they were railroaded into a political decision on this technology. Okay, that, the fact is he wants to talk about they're not substantially equivalent. There is a, a foreign gene Dave, in gotta, there. There's a I've Roundup Ready gene and interrupt. the BT gene in there that is patented. So there is a difference between those crops. <coughs> John, you're the only Thank one you. we haven't heard from on this topic. <laughs> I'll, give you, I'll give you 30 seconds. Uh, Again, I, I'm not a, a scientist or an expert in, in food science and technology. All I, all I know in, in my personal experience with my business is that GM and non-GM was a very, very critical issue, particularly in Europe. And today, actually, I was on the phone with some customers from Turkey and from Norway. And the very big issue in their mind is can, can we deliver to them a non-GMO product that is less than 1%. Actually, Turkey is 0% non-GM. Uh, non so it, it is an issue in the minds and the, of the people of a very large continent and, and the peoples of the world. And if you look at them, I think you'll find there for a long time, they've been practicing and preaching traceability as a very important part of, of satisfying the consumer that buys these products, whether fresh or pr processed, they, there is a traceability uh, requirement there in many of the European countries that show where that food has, it was derived from and what it, how it's been processed. So I think in the minds of consumers uh, here in US, it's becoming more and more uh, of an issue. Where is my food sourced from? How has it been processed? And how is it going to be uh, affecting my children and myself? I think it's a, it is a, a large issue that um, I, I don't think science is, is going to prove it on either side right now because of, as, as what we just heard, that it takes a, a human study takes a lot of unique emphasis to do. But I still think there is an issue here that when you disturb nature and you, and you change the, the ge genetic composition of the products, of the crops that we grow and the products we eat, there is a, a point of concern that, that I have chosen in my company and my career is to steer away from it. And as I said earlier, I'm a strong believer that there's enough variation, enough good science can be practiced with a non-GMO background that we could deliver very healthy food to the world and to our families. It's been reported that about 6% of all food in Iowa K through 12 schools is locally sourced. Katie, um, how can we improve that number? I'm not sure, really. Um, we were just talking at dinner about how the food at Iowa State Dining is 12% locally sourced. And so maybe that's something um, that, you know, maybe a model that we can follow and work towards getting more, more food locally sourced. But one thing that I think is really important 
Um, our turkey farm is very large, and every year this time of year, I get questions about how people can buy our turkey for Thanksgiving, and I tell them that they can go get a Subway sandwich after their Thanksgiving meal, because our turkey actually ends up at Subway uh, nationally. West Liberty Foods and West Liberty Iowa provides most of Subway's meat, about 70 to 80 percent of Subway's meat nationally. So although I think it would be nice if we could source more things from local farmers, I think we also need to recognize the impact that our big farms have locally here in Iowa, whether it's an economic impact or whether it's products like, like turkey from Iowa that end up at Subway or Hellman's mayonnaise that's made with um, soybean oil that comes from Iowa or all of the eggs in Iowa, the pork in Iowa. We have a lot of we can look at local foods in a different way and realize that we're consuming a lot more of them than we think. Larry, this is a topic uh, dear to your heart. I think probably more than anything, John, it's a budgetary issue mm -hmm. for local schools to buy more locally grown food. I know if I wanted to sell food to local schools, it would be a budgetary issue for me. Um, they, they don't have the ability to pay a small farmer such as myself the amount of money that you require to make a living from it. Um, we, we try to do, so, you know, we, we have some school kids out at the farm quite a bit. And we have them plant things. We have them pull things out of the ground, you know, those sorts of things. We, we try to do what we can, but I think, you know, it's, it's a dollars and cents issue at the school level. I mean, the, you know, they don't even have enough money to buy the necessary supplies for the kids, let alone buying, you know, lettuce from me or, or someone else. As a former teacher, I can definitely speak to that. You know, it was do not make copies. We're out of paper by December. Yeah. And, and you were on your own. So it is, it, there's definitely those economic um, forces at Nature, too, that are working against local foods in schools. Wayne, is this an important topic to you or not? Am, am I missing something here, or is it because schools in agriculture are counter-cyclical? If we had year-round schools, there, there would be availability of produce as school children were attending school in June, July, and August. But uh, in the spring and the fall, we could do some planting, I suppose, and they would be interested. Maybe some fall harvest, but... Uh, the, the main fruit and vegetable season, well, some fruits, I suppose, in the fall would work. Um, but, but isn't it just a, a, a counter-seasonal thing that's not happening for schools and agriculture? Interesting point. Um, mm -hmm. Dave, let me ask you about legal barriers to marketing mm. locally grown food. Uh, you sense uh, FDA is making it difficult? Yeah, I would just say, listen, I think the school lunch program is a great solution for small and beginning farmers to, and also a way to revamp local economies. You know, studies show that a dollar in a local economy spent in that community turns over seven times within that community. Farm to school programs are a great, great way for farmers to, to support their community. It's also a way for, um, for the ch children to learn where their food comes from and to support that farmer. The fact is there are always legal and regulatory hurdles for farmers to go through when they want to participate in a, in a new market. I think there is there's some really good programs out there. The, the USDA has a farm to school program that they've been tracking. Uh, there's a farm to school org, I think, that's been tracking this. Iowa has a farm to school program. But you said it's only 6%. The fact is Iowa has some of the richest and most fertile topsoil on the planet. And we are using, I think, 97% of the soy grown here in the US, in, in Iowa, I'm sorry, it's genetically engineered, 91% of the corn. The truth is farmers that, that grow corn and soy, that take subsidies from the, from the USDA, they can't plant fruits and vegetables. There is a restriction there that doesn't allow them to plant fruits and vegetables. That could be another avenue for them to be able to supply if that restriction was lifted. I think it was actually put in place because Western fruit and vegetable producers didn't want some corn growers to, uh, in the Midwest to compete against them. But anyway, that is a, right now that's a regulatory hurdle. At the same time, there is a Food Safety Modernization Act that is being um, put forward right now. The final rules are being finalized at the Food and Drug Administration, and they are, they are potentially going to be very harmful to farmers, small and mid-sized farmers that are engaged in direct sale to consumers, either at farmers markets or CSAs. And I think that there is um, some, 
the tester and Hagen amendments were these manager's amendments that we won in a kind of a floor fight to pass the Food Safety and Modernization Act bill in 2010. So you pass a bill and then you have to write rule, the, the agency that's responsible has to write regulations on how to enforce it. Currently there is a lot of controversy about how these rules and regulations will impact small and mid-sized farmers and organic farmers. And I would say um, one of the more ridiculous things that they're trying to do, they're creating one size fits all food safety regulations based on the major food safety outbreaks that have been brought to us by industrial scale agriculture and also industrial scale um, food production. One of the major food outbreaks was happened here in Iowa with the DeCoster egg facilities. Two years ago, half a billion eggs were contaminated with salmonella. The fact is a small farmer, they want to they place the same type of food safety regulations on, on a small farmer that the DeCosters should have to, um, to actually comply with. And I think that, you know, right now, I would say right now, we really need the American public to understand that regulations are written in a way not to benefit fam small family farmers, but actually to benefit corporations. And we're having that fight right now in Washington, D.C. We're going to open up the questioning here in just a second. I want to give Wayne uh, a chance here to respond on government regulations. You have it? No, oh, just the, the whole irony of the, the, the group that thinks we don't have enough GMO regulations doesn't want GMO re uh, any regulations or less regulations for itself. Uh, Quite frankly, we have uh, zero evidence of a GMO ever causing as much as a rash, and yet around the world, uh, we have deaths that occur from contaminated food. And unless you think it's okay to get food poisoning from a small farmer, but it's not okay to get one from a large farmer, we need to be consistent. I agree. I think um, as a large farmer, one of my best friends is a small farmer who uh, grows for the farmer's market, and she also has poultry and um, laying hens. They sell a lot of eggs. And it really disappoints me when people equate a small farm like hers as a good farm that doesn't need to be regulated, but a large farm like mine must automatically need more regulations because we are bad farmers. Even though we are both family farmers that work really, really hard on our farms that put animal welfare and animal care first and we're making decisions based on science and what works best on our farm, um, that, that's disappointing to me that it's, that it's one versus the other, small is good and big is bad. We're gonna open up the questions now to the audience uh, here and online and Jordan, what do you have first? Yes, I've got a question here, um, and this might be for Larry. Um, what are consumers citing as the main reasons they are interested in eating locally grown food? Is it ethical, or is it economic reasons, or a little bit of both? Well, <laughs> I could talk for probably 30 minutes on on, on my feelings about why people would No, like you're to, limited to three. I know. <laughs> two minutes and 48 seconds. Yes. Um, we've done, I've done, the downtown Des Moines Farmers Market since 1997. 26 markets a year. That means I've done something like 442 farmers markets. And in those 17 years from 97 to 2013, the interest in where, the interest by consumers and where their food comes from is increased at an exponential rate. I mean, it's just unbelievable. We, in 1997, when we started, we almost never got a question about how our food was grown or, or how we, what we used for fertilizer or, you know, what our farming practices were. Now, if, you know, we have someone who's never bought anything from us before. Often they want to know, you know, the whole life history of the farm, which I, I find that refreshing because one of the, the main goals of what we do at the farmer's market is to educate people about where their food comes from and have them realize it just doesn't magically appear on this table or magically appear on their grocery store shelves, that it's a laborious, long process for it to happen. And, and I think the main reason they want to know, this is an editorial comment, you know, I have no sound science, this is anecdotal only, but the main reason people want to know where their food comes from is because all of the problems that they read about in the food supply. And they want to know 
just exactly as you as exact as you can tell them in 30 or 60 seconds of the farmers market what your practices are and I think um you know, Larry has a, a real advantage in this situation because he does sell directly to consumers. He can talk to them face to face and tell them about the process that went into growing that food. Whereas Wayne and I, we don't we don't sell directly to consumers. We can't talk to them face to face, but we can talk to them via social media or at events like this and share that information that they want to know too. Um, you know, they, they may not know if they go to Subway that that turkey specifically came from my farm, but I can tell them about turkey farms, help calm their fears so that they know that the things that they have read about and the things that they have heard, those are the acts of just a few bad eggs in our industry and that the majority of farmers, 96% of the farmers in the United States are family farmers like us who care just as much about what we're doing as Larry does. Larry just gets to tell it to them to their face and we don't get to. So. Well, you know, and, and I, I've heard that before, but that's, you know, I've chosen to do it this way you know, yes. um, for a reason. And, and we've chosen and, and, to farm and, and, our way for reasons, yeah. too. Yeah. And, uh, and there are different reasons, and we've chosen different ways of farming, but that doesn't mean that either way is bad or that either type of food is no, I, inherently no. bad. No, I agree. You know, we, there, there's plenty of room here for both of us. That's we, right. We agree. I hope. Question from the audience. My name is John Johnson with the National Pork Board, and I'd like to return to the subject of labeling. Katie's comment about whether that's truly an effective way to educate consumers got me thinking. Um, most of our consumers today, most of the general public, know very little about plant science or science generally or, or have an understanding of biological processes, and they probably don't even stop to realize that for centuries we've manipulated single-cell organisms to produce our, our beer, our wine, our bread, a whole variety of things, and we've used conventional plant breeding to take a, a grass uh, from a tropical climate and now we're growing corn in North Dakota. Uh, with conventional breeding, we've done a lot of things, not genetically modified organisms, but just conventional plant breeding. And conventional plant breeding can also produce varieties that have allergens and, and toxins that are also not subject to any approval by FDA, but it seems that some folks want a more rigorous approval for something that's done with a different level of science than what our more pedestrian sciences produce the same hazards. And the, given the consumer's lack of knowledge of, about science generally, it reminded me of a survey I read about recently where many consumers, when surveyed, expressed concern about a colorless, odorless chemical compound in their food known as dihydrogen monoxide. And I was wondering if the panel that supports GMO labeling would support labeling for dihydrogen monoxide. <laughs> Dave? Well, I'll take that real quickly. Let's, let's be honest here. Farmers have bred plants and animals for 10,000 years, and they created benefits. They have traits, desired traits. They have higher yields. They taste better. The, 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 the pig has a higher, has a, a better mothering instinct. Okay, that's, that's been done for 10,000 years. What we're talking about is a brand new science of artificially inserting foreign genes, okay, into plants, and animals. This is a new technology that has new risks. These are risks, okay, the fact is we're not asking it for it to be banned, we're not asking for it to go away, we're asking for a simple label, okay? Just because um, farmers have bred in livestock or animals for 10,000 years this way, a certain way, and then a new technology comes along, doesn't mean um, that they're the same risks. The FDA's own scientists know that, the fact is, when you're looking at labeling, you have to look at what is, it, what, are, what, is, what do consumers want? I mean, so my estimation of that gentleman's question is, he says the American people are too stupid to understand what they're eating. They're too dumb to understand the science behind this. I don't believe that. I believe the American people are capable of electing our elected officials and the president. I think they're capable of understanding science. I think really more importantly, they're, they really have, they're really concerned about what's in their food and a label is not going to harm a producer. It's not going to harm the chemical companies. The fact is they already label these same products in 64 other countries around the world. What are they afraid of here in the United States? You know, Monsanto came out in favor of labeling in the United Kingdom, in Britain, in the early 2000s. The question is, why are they opposing it here in the U.S.? And it's because they perceive that their rights are more important than your rights. Their right to protect their patent 
and the right to sell you unlabeled GMOs is more important than your basic democratic right to know what's in your food.